Hey guys, what's up? John here from fly8mikealpha.com. Today we'll be taking you through a commercial pilot oral. Jackie was kind enough to come in and sit down for a commercial pilot oral with us. This is going to be a simulated cross-country flight or simulated oral exam based in Long Island, New York from Republic Airport FRG out to Uniform 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 just on the other side of the water there, just to the north. So. We will take you from start to finish. Of course, here on YouTube, you'll see about the first 20 some minutes or so. If you want to see the full video, you can check it out online at flyatmikehealth.com. It is part of the commercial pilot boot camp to get you ready for your commercial pilot check ride. Now, no check ride is ever perfect, no oral exam is ever perfect. And when you hear something that's maybe not quite right here, you'll notice that with a little horn or a little buzzer. So we'll alert you if maybe there's an incorrect answer or something that could be done a little bit better. And then of course, we'll give you the correct answer to just make it a little bit more fun and interesting for you. So you can see how in reality, how things really go. And then also how it should go on your commercial pile check ride. Hopefully you can give them a perfect answer to every question. Hopefully this video helps. Any questions, leave it in the comments below. Check out the Commercial Pilot Bootcamp online at flyatmikealpha.com. I'll quit talking, let's get to the oral. So, thank you for coming in today, Jackie. You are here for a Commercial Pilot check ride. And uh, we are doing this check ride today from Republic Airport mm -hmm. on Long Island. And our cross country is going to be to Uniform, uniform, uniform. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll ask you some questions about that once we get started. But I think... Pardon me for the phone. I think you know the drill with check rides, and I've already been through a few of them. So there's three possible outcomes here today. Obviously, as far as I'm concerned, you've already passed. You're already a commercial pilot. We just need to prove that now. Okay. Um, the other option would be if we find some holes and knowledge or any deficient areas, then we may give you the opportunity to go back to your CFI and get retrained on those and then come back and complete this another day. And the third option would be if at any point you feel that you're tired, hungry, don't want to fly, the weather's no good, either one of us can discontinue the check ride at any point for any reason, and uh, no harm, no foul, no extra penalties, no fees, nothing like that. We can just come back another day and finish it. It's not a pass or a fail. It's just we're going to pause and then resume at a later date. Uh, and so either one of us can say that, so it's totally up to you at any point if you do want to discontinue. Cool. Um, before we get started, any questions, you know where the bathroom is, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, okay. Awesome, cool. Then we've looked through your logbook already. It looks like you meet all the aeronautical experience requirements in uh, 61129 for being a commercial pilot. You've got your knowledge test report here and you got a 96 on that, so congratulations. Um, there's a few questions here, a few PLT codes we'll go over, um, and that'll really be wrapped into the questioning that we go through as we work through the ACS here. So. Uh, any questions at all before we get started? No, I'm good. Awesome. We'll probably ditch our Alaskan weather here and stick with just the weather for the New York area today. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we'll need that Alaskan stuff. So first question I have for you is you become a commercial pilot today and tomorrow uh, your mom calls you up and says, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. You need to fly us to the Hamptons and you know, you've earned it. We'll give you a thousand bucks to fly us out to the Hamptons, you know, your dad and I or whatever. Uh, can you do that? I... Yeah, if they're coming out to you, because uh, it's not like you're promoting yourself. So. Okay, yeah. so um, so that would fall under more like private carriage then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, any specific things you might have to check into before performing private carriage? Would you know the airplane have to meet any certain specific requirements? Or would you need a 135 certificate? Or is it okay to do under Part 91? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, 135 certificate. Oh, gosh, why am I forgetting this? <laughs> That's <laughs> all right. It was private. Um, well, so if there's any question in your mind whether or not you could actually accept money for the flight, I mean, we know that you could obviously do a cost sharing like you when you were a private pilot. Yeah. Um, if there's any doubt in your mind if you could do, if you actually accept money for the flight, who could you call to find out about that? Uh, I mean... Call your FISDO, I guess. Yeah, sure. Question, yeah. yeah, call a FISDO um, out in Long Island and say, hey, you know, here's the situation. Is this cool? Or do I need an LOA or do I need a 135 certificate or anything like that? Say you got a uh, your Piper Warrior here and you own the airplane and you're like, hey, this is sweet. I own an airplane. I'm a commercial pilot. And everybody loves doing those tours down the Hudson River. And so you put a sign on the side of the road that says Jackie's Tours. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fly the Hudson River. Yeah. Uh, can you do that? No. What would you need to do if you wanted to do something like that? You need an operating certificate. Okay, some sort of letter of agreement. Yeah. Uh, maybe like a 91-147 deal where uh, you would have a LOA with FISO to do scenic tour of flights or something like that. Yep. So, very cool. Now, what would you have to have on you to go fly, say, if you were just going to go fly with your parents out to the Hamptons, 
and you're just, you know, cost sharing or whatever, what sort of documents would you have to have on your person? Uh, for me as the pilot, definitely mm -hmm. my medical, definitely my certificate, uh, government photo ID, so that okay. driver's license, passport. Do you use your logbook? Uh, no, you don't need your logbook. Okay. And in your logbook, though, what would it have to say to actually make you current uh, to do that flight? Say you get your license today and you haven't flown in maybe six months. Would you be current to go fly with passengers? Well, uh, so there's that uh, reg about, you know, uh, carrying passengers. Uh, so you have to be current within the last 90 days. You must have had at least to do three takeoffs and landings during the day. Mm -hmm. And then nighttime, those landings just have to be a full stop. Okay, so 6157 tells us that we have to do three takeoffs and landings uh, every 90 days. Yep. And that how long or how does that qualify for daytime versus nighttime? Like how long before sunrise or how long after sunset? Oh, yes. So you have to do it um, an hour after sunset or an hour before sunrise to okay. make those landings. Got you. So say, uh, you know, you haven't flown in six months. You want to take your parents to the Hamptons. So you're going to fly out there and uh, you say, hey, you know, sunset's 5 p.m. Uh, we're running late. We're going to get in the airplane here at 445. But we should be on the ground by about 540. And uh, sunset was 5 p.m. So could you do that if you hadn't done the three takeoffs and landings at night? Maybe you just did three touch and goes during the day? Uh. Well, night nighttime's kind of tricky because there's a couple of different definitions, right? Sure. So what are those definitions? Oh, good question. Uh, so there's, you know, when you need your landing light on, so that's sunset to sunrise. Um, mm -hmm. Take off the landings that we're talking about to stay current. That's an hour after sunset, an hour before sunrise. Mm -hmm. And then uh, nighttime uh, to log it is, you know, between civil morning and civil evening twilight. Okay. Uh, so, I'm sorry, civil evening and civil morning twilight. So, um... So, yeah, I guess you have to look up when civil twilight is uh, okay. to figure out if you can make those landings or not. Gotcha. So, uh, if we, we're going to take off um, out of Republic and fly out to the Hamptons, and sunset was 5 p.m., and we're going to be on the ground. We know we're going to be on the ground by, like, 5.40. Say civil twilight was 5.30. Would that be okay? Uh, I want to say no. Okay. And uh, maybe somewhere here in 61.57, it would tell us, that, uh, you know, we need to be able to land 59 minutes after sunset, you know, before that one hour cutoff yeah. for the purpose of night currency. So as long as we're landing one hour before or uh, less than one hour after sunset, then that wouldn't be considered a night landing for the purpose of Part 61. Uh, although you might be logging night flight time, like you said, you might yeah. log 10 minutes of night flight time, it wouldn't be considered a night landing. So that would be okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. kind of interesting it's there. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> sure. Now, you had mentioned one thing there about civil twilight and uh, turning on some lights and things. So can you tell me about that rule? Uh, so, the, yeah, the landing light rule that I was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. So you need a landing light for hire um, okay. for at night time, and that has to be turned on sunset to sunrise. Okay, gotcha. Um, that's interesting. Could we, um, could we fly an airplane at night that wasn't equipped with a landing light? Um, well, it depends if it's for hire or not. Okay, let's say it's not for hire. It's, if it's not for hire, you don't need one. Okay, so we wouldn't necessarily have to turn it on sunset to sunrise because no. it's not required if it's not for hire. Yeah. Gotcha, okay, and something like 91205 would probably tell us that. Yep. Yeah, so what's required. Now, what is required for flying at night? What kind of lights? Uh, your anti-collision. Okay. Yep. Any other lights? Position lights. Position lights, okay, and when do we have to turn those on? Um... Is that sunset or is that civil twilight? Yeah, I want to... I'm going to say civil twilight. Okay. Well, and you might <laughs> find that it's actually uh, <laughs> sunset. Is it? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so right at sunset. Because at sunset, things... You know, it's easier to see them starting basically from sunset onward. If the sun's above the horizon, it's hard to see those position lights. Those red and green and white lights don't show up very well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, after sunset, they start to show up, even though it's still kind of light out. Yeah. Um, and obviously, they show up more and more as we get towards civil twilight and beyond. So... Uh, yeah, so from sunset to sunrise, we need to have our position lights turned on. Okay, good to know. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that sounds good. Now, talk to me about your medical certificate. Um, you're under 40 years old, mm -hmm. so how long, uh, or I guess what class medical certificate do you have right now? So right now I have a second class. Okay, yeah. and how long is that valid for? Uh, that is valid for only another year or so. Okay, so you have 12 calendar months yeah. at the second class level, yeah. and then... 
Uh, do you have to go get another medical certificate, or do you, are you still able to fly, say, not for hire? Yeah, it depends what you're trying to practice. Um, if I'm trying to, you know, use my commercial private pilot privileges, I probably should. Well, no, you need a second class medical for that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're just an instructor, or if you're just flying on your own, you really only need a third class. Okay, and how uh, long would you have at the third class level with that second class medical? Uh, so what do you mean by that? <laughs> so let's say you get your medical today. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so February 1st, you get your medical. And obviously, you know, you're going to have second class privileges, like you told me, for 12 calendar months until February 28th next year. Yeah. Now, how long would you have third class privileges for? Would it expire uh, February 28th next year as well? Or would you be able to... No. Uh, so you have another 36 calendar months, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe something like uh, if we look in 61, 23, maybe that would tell us that uh, we would have about one year at the second class level. And since you are under uh, 61, 23, so we have medical certificates, requirements, and duration. And we look at this handy little chart here that they explained for us, and we would find that under 40, we would have 12 months at the second class level and 48 months remaining at the third class level. Because how long is a third class typically good for when you're under 40? Uh, 60. 60 no. months. Yeah, so we would have 12 and 48. So we would have 12 months and then four years. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm like doing the math wrong. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, a little minor math mistake oh, there. No, it sounds like uh, you, you had the right answer there, though. So let's say you get a first class medical okay. today, yeah. February 1st, 2020. Yeah. You get a first class medical. Mm -hmm. Now, how long would that medical be valid for and what could you do with it? Well, as. Uh, if I get a first class medical, I'm under 40, um, the first class medical will only be good for, you know, 12 calendar months. Okay. Um, if I... And then I mean, do you have second class privileges after that or... Yeah. Okay, so you would have 12 months at the first class privileges. Yep. And would you still be able to fly for hire after 12 months of getting... Uh, yes, because for a commercial license, you only need a second class. So how does that medical progress? We get the first class for 12 months, mm -hmm. and then it goes to second class, or does it go right down to the third class? Uh, first, second, and then third class. Okay, that's interesting. So we might find in this table here that we have 12 months at the first class level. Yeah. It skips second class altogether, and then what we're left with is 48 calendar months at the third class level. Oh, oh, really? Yes. Yeah, holy crap. Yeah. Okay, wait. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, last question about the medical certificates and duration I have for you. So, we've got the 12 months at first class. No more, basically, the longest you could ever have commercial pilot privileges on a medical would be 12 calendar months yeah. without going for another exam. Okay. So, we got the 12 months first class. We skip the second. We go right down to uh, third class. It'd be interesting if we were over 40, we would have uh, six months at the first class level six months at the second class level, and then uh, just 12 months at the third class level because third class medical certificates are typically only good for either two years or five years. Yeah. Um, now, where is that cutoff delineated? So if you're 39 years old and you get your first class medical certificate, you're 39 and 11 months old, would that be good for one year or would it only be good for six months because you're going to be turning 40 soon? Mm. I think whatever age you are at when you get your medical certificate. At the date of examination. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The age you are at the date of examination. So that's what determines it. So great idea that right before you turn 40, you go yeah. get another medical certificate. You get to get all that extra time on there compared mm -hmm. to if you waited just a few more days till when you actually turned 40. So good. That sounds good to me. Um, and you mentioned you have to have the medical certificate on you when you're flying. What sort of... Uh, you know, documents do you have to have in the airplane when you're flying? So those are your, I mean, everyone uses the acronym ARO or AROs, depends on uh, what you need. Uh, so A being airworthiness, um, mm -hmm. one of the R's being registration, mm -hmm. another one being your radio license for international flights. Sure. Um, o, operating handbook, W, weight and balance. Okay, sounds good. Um, and we'll come back to the ARO acronym here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, tell me though, when does your commercial pilot certificate expire? So if you get your commercial pilot certificate today, when would that expire? Uh, so it doesn't really ever expire. It's more that you have to just keep current with it, right? So you need mm -hmm. to make sure you do your flight review um, every two years or 24 calendar months. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, to 
pretty much like what you said before, though, if you're going to carry passengers, you have to be current with your takeoffs and landings. So. Every 90 days, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And um, let's say, do you have your, your instrument rating? Mm -hmm. I saw that in your logbook that you do. So um, I guess that wouldn't really apply. But if you didn't have your instrument rating, would you have any limitations on you flying yes. for hire? Yeah. Uh, okay. Flying at nighttime uh, with passengers as well as you would be limited to how far you could go. Okay. So we couldn't fly over... Uh, 50 miles with passengers on board from the original point of departure and we couldn't fly with passengers at night mm -hmm. for hire um, if we didn't have our instrument rating and were a commercial pilot. Makes sense. Um, cool. And then uh, what would you put in your logbook then? If, you know, say, uh, you know, you go flying with your parents out to the Hamptons, do you have to legally put that in your logbook? No, you don't have to unless okay. you're trying to work towards another rating. Okay, so anything where, if we're going to use flight time towards another certificate or rating like your ATP probably after this commercial, yep. then you'd want it to go in your logbook. And uh, any other time we would have to log things in our logbook? Uh, again, going back to the flight reviews, if mm -hmm. you have that. Um, and then, yeah, uh, currency again, uh, you know, you take off some landing. Sure, anything to show legal currency for the flight we would have to log. Yeah. Besides that, we don't really have to log it. Cool. And just... Kind of random question, what factors would go into kind of you as a person deciding whether or not you're safe for this flight out to the Hamptons? What kind of factors might you think about? Any sort of checklist you use on your pre-flight to determine, you know, if you're good and the airplane's good and all those things? Yep, PAVE checklist. Okay. Yeah. So what is the PAVE checklist? Uh, so that's just an acronym standing for P as the pilot. Mm -hmm. So that's you doing, you know, your I'm safe checklist, make okay. sure you're okay. A standing for aircraft, making sure the aircraft's airworthy, doing your pre-flight. Mm -hmm. um, v, uh, it's kind of backwards a little bit, but it stands for environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so making sure the weather is good, and then E is any external pressures okay. that may be present. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, what kind of external pressures might be present doing this flight out to the Hamptons with your parents? Uh, probably pressure. You want to make them happy. You know, you yeah. just got your commercial pilot license. Mm -hmm. so you just want to, I don't know, show it off a little bit. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, and um, and maybe you go to the Hamptons, and then you're coming back the next day, and your your dad says, "I got I got to get back to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to get to work so I can go make money to pay all your pilot training loans, yeah. <laughs> um, because you're you don't even have a job yet. Yeah. You got your commercial pilot trip. I don't understand this. You're a commercial pilot, but you don't have a job. Oh, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> um, so he's like, "I got to get back to work, and the weather's just terrible. And you know, what do you tell him? Well, uh, you know, you have to make your own personal minimums as a pilot, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you have to stick with whatever. I mean, safety first, right? Sure. So. Would it be a consideration, you know, whether or not you should do the flight based on, you know, how important it is that he gets back? No. Uh, just because if you're letting an external pressure kind of mm -hmm. get to you and you're already kind of going up with a risk, you know. Sure. Um, having that pressure over your mm -hmm. head. And also, if you're going to do things that maybe you normally wouldn't be comfortable with, mm -hmm. so that's just not... Just because situation. you have somebody with you, yeah. Yeah, so whatever the factors are, you just look at the facts yeah. and you try to leave all the emotional stuff out of it. Yeah. Um, do you have any personal minimums that you uh, you kind of keep in mind or you fly with it that you've written down at all? Yeah, uh, so I... Um... I mean, yeah, when I did my commercial check ride, I definitely wasn't, you know, super comfortable because it's not like we have a lot mm -hmm. of hours, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, my minimums were kind of high, I guess. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, back then, I definitely didn't want to fly with less than 4,000 ceilings. I mm -hmm. wanted at least eight statue miles visibility. Sure. Which yeah. is pretty high. I know I mm -hmm. have my commercial license, but I just didn't feel like I had all the experience yet mm -hmm. to have those minimums lowered. Yeah, no, absolutely. The instrument rating. <laughs> yeah. How do you work to lower your personal minimums? Um, well, just kind of practicing and getting more comfortable, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in the aircraft that you're in, maybe you're switching around different aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, just getting used to the area more and being more comfortable, at least going up by yourself a couple mm -hmm. times. So would the aircraft have an influence on your personal minimums? Say you have, you know, 200 hours in this warrior, but you only have 10 hours in a 172 would your personal minimums differ between the two aircraft? Oh, yeah, probably. Okay. Sure. Different yeah. feel. Um, even every aircraft has different avionics as well, mm -hmm. so it depends how equipped they are. Sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Um, getting back to that uh, aero acronym that we had mentioned. So with aero, you mentioned the airworthiness, the registration, operating handbook, radio operator uh, license if you're flying international, and then, uh, the of course, the registration uh, and the weight and balance and everything. So the radio operator's license... Is that for you or for the aircraft? Uh, that is for... 
I want to say that's for the aircraft as well, right? Okay, so it'd be for both then. Yeah, for um, both. Yeah, so you would need a radio operator's license for you as a person, and then the aircraft would need one as well because it has a, it's a radio station. It, it's broadcasting out from itself. So, yeah. so two certificates involved there. Um, and then with the registration, how long is that good for? Three years. Three years, awesome. And how long is the airliness certificate good for? As long as the registration is current. <laughs> okay, so as long as the registration is current, um, it's good. So if I walk up to an airplane, maybe it hasn't flown in 10 years, um, hasn't been annualed in 10 years, uh, but they kept up the registration, uh, then the airliness certificate is still valid? Well, um, not really, though, because it's mm -hmm. up to the PIC at the end of the day as well if it's airworthy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... Yeah, even though... So if it hasn't been annual in 10 years, would that be airworthy? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. So would the airworthiness certificate be valid? No. Okay. What um, would we... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, what would we have to do to make the airworthiness certificate valid? Uh, make sure all the inspections are completed, as well as... Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the registration. Um, I think that's it. I'm trying sure. To... <laughs> yeah, all the required inspections. Yeah. Um, that's a short list, right? All yeah. the required inspections. It's not like there's tons of them or anything. Yeah, no. So, um, yeah, what are they? Uh, so I like to use A, B, it's, uh, A standing for the annual, B, mm -hmm. B, O, R, um, A, B, it's SI, but it's really one for 100 hours, mm -hmm. uh, then the altimeter, transponder, ELT, and then uh, the static system, but I know some people combine that with the altimeter, so. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so just for a regular VFR flight, what's required for us for VFR flight? Pretty much just the annual, mm -hmm. uh, ELT, transponder, and then 100 hour if you're for high. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So let's say this airplane, uh, it's a flight school airplane that uh, we're using today, this Warrior, and we look in the books here and we notice it's, uh, you know, oh, it's 101 hours since the last 100 hour inspection. Is there any way we could legally go fly that airplane? Yes, only if you, uh, well, you have to go to the FISDO and... Um, I'm sorry, actually, you don't have to go to the FISDO, I'm thinking something else. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use up to 10 hours past the 100 hour mm -hmm. for you to bring it somewhere where you can get 100 hour maintenance done. Sure. So let's say we finally get somewhere where the maintenance can be done. There's 105 hours since the last inspection. All right, so at, you know, the inspection was last done at 2,000 hours. It's due at 2,100. We're now at 2,105. When would the next inspection be due? 2,205 or 2,200? Uh... 2200. 2200. Yeah. So we can't use the additional time that we overflew towards the next inspection. It actually kind of comes off that next inspection. Yeah. So instead of be doing it a hundred, doing a hundred hours, it'd be doing 95 hours past yeah. that. Gotcha. No, that makes good sense to me. Um, so, and then the annual, I, I would assume that's done once a year, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And how often is that ELT uh, inspected? So there's a couple of different things. Um, mm -hmm. Either if it's been used uh, for one cumulative hour, mm -hmm. uh, half its battery life, and 12 calendar months. So there's three different options. Okay, so we inspect it every 12 calendar months. Okay. Uh, we replace the battery if more than 50% of the battery life, useful battery life has been used up. Yep. And... Uh, or if it's been in operation for more than one hour, how would you know if I handed you an ELT today? Or for this Piper Warrior we have, how would you know if that ELT has been on for more than an hour? Is there like a counter on it or? That's a how? good question. Um, I actually don't know if I know that answer. <laughs> okay. So we'll go ahead and take a break from this video right here and we'll resume the video, the rest of the commercial pilot oral exam online at fly8mikealpha.com in the commercial pilot checkride bootcamp. If you're getting ready for your commercial pilot checkride or you just want to brush up on some things, awesome course to check out. Really recommend you take a look at that. We have a fantastic pass rate for everyone that goes through that course, and we guarantee you will pass your check ride when you complete that course online at flyatmikealpha.com. Thanks so much for Jackie for being a good sport here. Of course, not everyone's going to be perfect, and like we said, we'll let you know when one of our applicants isn't perfect, and we'll go ahead and fix those answers so you have the right answers the day of your check ride. Any questions, leave them below. Remember, if you can't fly every day, flyatmikealpha.com. We'll see you in the commercial pilot checkride boot camp.